This is Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network. The demand to defund the police is spreading across the country, rising up from the ongoing protests in response to the public lynching of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, as well as the shooting death of Breonna Taylor during a no-knock warrant gone wrong in Louisville, Kentucky, the police mocking Sean Reed on video after they chased and shot him in Indianapolis, Indiana, the attempted cover-up by the police and prosecutor's office of the vigilante murder of Ahmad Arbery in Glen County, Georgia, and just last week, the fatal shooting of Rashard Brooks in the back by police in Atlanta, Georgia, and all of this after years and years of unaccounted for shootings of mostly Black, Latino, Indigenous people, but also of poor white people by members of what is called law enforcement across this country. But the people in the streets contend that these alleged public servants aren't serving the public, that they aren't enforcing the law as much as they are acting too often as sidewalk judge, jury, and executioners, and that their police department budgets represent too sizable a portion of most cities' expenditures that should be reallocated to other areas that would truly serve the people and improve the people's lives. This is the basis for the call to defund the police, but we have to ask, is it enough to solve the problem of the epidemic of extrajudicial police murder that must come to an end? We're here to talk with me about defunding the police and what truly changing policing would really mean is Frank Chapman, the executive director of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Frank, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Frank, of course, this conversation around defunding the police is uh, taking center stage, coming from the ongoing protests. And I feel like the last conversation you and I had uh, last year was ahead of its time. We talked about an issue that I know you're going to bring up uh, later on in this discussion, but I want to start with this idea of defunding the police. Um, should police budgets be slashed and reallocated to other services? Because that's the demand. And I wanna get your thoughts on that particular issue. Yeah, I, I have, you know, uh, we've been involved in, in, in the struggle to, uh, for community control of the police uh, since 1969. And our organization has been involved in the struggle since 1973. And you know we don't have no we don't have no problem with defunding the police. We just got a problem about who's going to be in charge. Uh, and and you know if if you're going to leave the people who have created the problem in the first place in charge, then obviously that's, it's it's going to be a problem with the defunding. Uh, yeah, the police need to be defunded just like just like the Pentagon. Now, if you're talking about budget cuts and whatnot, it should be substantial because let me give an example. Uh, a little over $100 million, the mayor of Los Angeles has already said he's taken out of the police budget to commit to uh, a community. That's, that's peanuts, you know. Uh, and that's what we are afraid of happening if you leave those people who are in power in charge of this, you know. They, uh, you know, they're, they're still neoliberals. They, they're not gonna, they haven't stopped being that because there's a rebellion going on. They're still gonna try to do the budget shifts in such a way as to leave our people at a disadvantage. We need the people who are impacted by the police and and the huge budget of, around which they operate to be in charge of the defunding. That's yeah. why we say defunding cannot take place in the absence of community control. If it does then you're going to get a recycling of the problem. You know, defunding has to take place with the community in charge of the defunding. That's how, that's how we see it. Uh, in the legislation that we have proposed here in Chicago for an all elected civilian police accountability council, we've had defunding in there since we first drew the legislation up back in 2013. Wow. So this is not, this is not something new. It just came up, you know, uh, this has been there. Uh, what we are afraid of, well, we're not afraid of it, but, but, but what, what we caution people about is this. You know, 
don't let those who created the problem be in charge of solving it. And, and the example that you raised with uh, the one police department um, uh, uh, committing to slashing their budget by $100 million and reallocating those funds, it is important who is doing this and who is deciding where those funds will be reallocated to because it does raise a few questions that if one police department could uh, that easily and that quickly decide, well, we don't need a hundred million dollars. People should be asking, well, how much more money do you have left that just giving away a hundred million dollars doesn't hurt? And people should also be asking, well, who's deciding who will get those $100 million in funds, what are those organizations' uh, uh, operations in the community and what ties do they have to the people making the decisions and the police departments themselves? Um, so, and, and I, think, I, I, I think it's really important that we make it clear that we need to be asking these questions uh, that you raised, who is doing this? Uh, who's making these decisions? when people are talking about defunding the police. Now, you mentioned community control over the police. Explain what this is, why it's important in the context of not just defunding the police, but changing the nature of policing as it exists in this country today. Well, you know, this is really a... Uh... A, 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 a struggle that's been going on in our community for, for damn near a century. And, 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 and you know, and we've come, to, we've come to some conclusions about how it has to be resolved, not based on, you know, some abstract theory, uh, but based on our actual experience as a movement, you know. And it has to be resolved like this, you know. It, it started back in the 60s with the Black Power Movement and with the Panthers. It has to be resolved like this here. We, who are impacted by police tyranny and terror, we have to be the ones in charge of the process. We have to be the ones in charge. Now, what we have to be in charge of is saying who polices our communities and how our communities are policed. How they are policed has a lot to do with the budget. Who, who polices our community has to do with eliminating racism in, in terms of the police department. You know, we want to make sure that racist Ku Klux Klan minded cops, and there's a whole bunch of them going on today, are not in our communities, police in our community. We want to we want to also demilitarize the police because the police also operate as an occupying army. You know, it's a paramilitary organization. And so some of that, like in Chicago, they got $1.4 billion budget. Some of that money is being used to buy hardware from the Pentagon, military hardware, you know. I mean, helicopters, uh, 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 you know, sniper equipment, armored cars, all of that stuff, you know. And so the defunding has to also be coupled with demilitarizing the police. And only our movement can make that happen, you know, because our movement is about putting the people in the community in charge of the policing that goes on in their communities. And once we have once we have empowered ourselves with that power, then we can proceed to defund the police according to our program, according to what we think is necessary for the community. We can proceed to demilitarize them in the same in the same manner, and then we can regulate them in terms of how they conduct themselves in our communities. You know, we can regulate them to the point of regulating them out of existence. People think I'm I'm, I'm joking when I say that. But I'm talking about policing as it exists today. You know, we can we can only eliminate that type of policing by community control of the police, by letting the people who are impacted be the ones in charge of defunding the police, demilitarizing the police, and regulating the police. If that's not going on, then it's just piecemeal reforms. You know, it's just you know they'll they'll, they'll give us a, a some defunding on one day with a teaspoon and take it back the next day with a shovel. So, because they'll be in charge of the process, not us. Mm. If mm. we're in charge of the process, we can make sure that these, that these reforms have a permanent impact in terms of our community because it's about power. If we're not changing the power relationships between the police and ourselves, then nothing changes. 
So we've got to change that power relationship. And that's not only true of the police, that's true of education, that's true of delivery of healthcare services, that's true of all of the institutions that function and operate in our communities. You know, we've got to, you know, be in charge. If we're not, it makes it makes no sense. It makes no sense. And see, you know, re reparations make more sense than just defunding, you know, because let me tell you why. We're talking about shifting the budget. Right. You know, so that, and we're talking about what they call reinvestment in our, in our communities and so forth and so on, you know. So and we're talking about doing that with the same system that has oppressed us and kept us in the situation that we're in for, for damn near 400 years, okay? So now, uh, we're for over 400 years. So now, if, we, if, 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 we're, if we're serious about this, then we have to say the oppression that has been that, that black people have been subjected to and 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 how we're still living under the vestiges of slavery with unemployment with bad housing poor delivery health services all the social economic conditions that you talk about you know uh then defunding the police is not going to is not going to release enough money to deal with all of those problems it's just not you know we're talking about Trillions of dollars, right? And so, and, and let's the, and so if we're going to demand something like budget shifts, let's demand reparations. Mm. Let's demand that 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 that, that we be we get reparations from the government to deal with the whole range of these problems to completely eliminate all the vestiges of slavery in this country. Mm. Now that's 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 what we should be talking about. Because you know, uh, like somebody asked me during a demonstration, they said, "Well, after you get after you get community control of the police, uh, then, then then what do you want? What, what are you going to want after that?" And my response was, "Everything, <laughs> everything. We want everything. Everything that's been taken from us, we want everything. You know, you've been robbing us for four centuries, so we want everything. We want complete, total restitution." And you know what, Frank, I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you brought up that question that someone asked you about once you get community control over the police, what else do you want after that? Because therein, I think, lies the crux of the issue that people in this country are afraid of the oppressed finally having the same level of power that they have always had. That At least that's how I see it. Is that how you see it also? Absolutely. Here's what we're talking about. We're talking about an unfinished revolution in this country that was started back during the Civil War. From 1861 to 1865, you know, you had a Civil War. Uh, at the time that the Civil War broke out, the highest investment in the country was in a slave. That was the highest investment in the country that anybody could make, was to buy, was to, was to buy a slave. Uh, because the, the slaveholders were, 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 were raking in something like over $300 billion, all right? And it was only 300,000 of them. So now when the Civil War broke out and when it ended, one thing changed forever, and that was the buying and selling of human beings, but not slavery, because they brought that back in the form of the 13th Amendment where right. they said, you know, slavery is abolished except for convicted persons. And then for a very, very brief period, from 1867 to 1877, you had what, what, what is called Black, Re what, what Dr. W.B. Du Bois called Black Reconstruction. But that was a revolutionary period in our history where democracy really happened for about 10 years, where Black folks were in charge of their own political destiny in those areas where we constituted a majority. And in those areas where we didn't constitute a majority, we coalesced a, 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 a coalition with poor white farmers and made some of the most radical changes in the history of this country. Public education come out of that period. Mm. The women's suffrage movement come out of that period, you know. So now, but that revolution was not finished. It was stopped. The Reconstruction governments were overthrown through Ku Klux Klan terrorism and then set up in its place 
was a police-like state called Jim Crow, which lasted mm -hmm. for, for you know damn near ninety years. So yeah. now, so now, we didn't finish that revolution. We're still dealing with it now. In terms of voting rights, take any problem that black people have. It's because that revolution was not finished, you know. But we can't we can't go back and in, in history and finish it. It won't it, it it won't be just us getting democratic rights and whatnot under this system, like we could have done done it then, but they missed that opportunity. So now it means that in order for us to get those rights, we gotta change the whole damn system from top to bottom. Like I I I have to ask you, when people say things like, well, listen. A lot of police departments have already instituted reforms. There are uh, community control boards and community oversight boards where members of the community are involved in some part of the process of reviewing police conduct. What's your response to those efforts of reform that have been implemented in some areas? Well, are, are, have they been useless? Are they worth anything? Are they really reforms? And do reforms matter? Can this system be reformed? Yeah, reforms reforms matter, but who? For, but for whom? You know, um, if it's a reform to maintain, if if it's a, if if it's, a, if it's a reform that does not change the power relationships between the oppressed and the oppressed, if it's a reform designed to maintain the status quo, then that's a reform that works for them. It's a, if it's a reform that changes the relationship between the oppressor and the oppressed in terms of power, then that works for us. Like the abolition of slavery worked for us, you know. Uh, doing away with Jim Crow worked for us, you know. Uh, and so we know how to get those kind of reforms. It's got to be a, 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 a social upheaval. That's that's how we get those. You don't get those kind of reforms by politicians suddenly having a change of heart. And suddenly mm. deciding that, well, you know, we haven't been treating these people fairly and, and, and it's time for us to get, get fair. Well, what's fair? You know, you mean uh, you're going you're gonna to give up your super profits that you get from exploiting us? You, you're going to give that up? You know, what's fair? Like Frederick Douglass says, a, a, a kinder slave master is not fair. You know, we want to get rid of slavery. You know, just to be better fed and better clothed under the same system that continues to exploit us and use us like animals, that's not fair. You know, we want to overturn this whole system and create one that is truly fair to the people. And then we want to be the ones who decide what is fair. Let us decide that, not, not you. you. You know, you have no moral authority over us to decide what's fair. You've been exploiting us and abusing us for four centuries. You don't have no moral authority to tell us about what's fair. You know, you need to get out. We need to get you out of there. And, you know, another issue that people are raising, Frank, in the context of, of uh, changing policing in America is the issue of qualified immunity. And I, I feel like this is certainly a legal issue that needs to be addressed. The police are immune from being sued individually for some acts of uh, violence that they commit against people. And this is, I think, where the police unions come in and defend police officers. And according to some laws, individual people who might be able to sue the police department uh, for a wrongful death in a civil suit, right. or they may be able to sue the city, cannot sue the individual person who actually took someone's life. Uh, so this is an issue that's been raised uh, in this discussion yeah, that, around that's, that's, policing. Yeah. That's another example of injustice. But, uh, but also, look, look at it like this here. Tell me, what union in the United States of North America defends its members if they are accused of the crime of murder? Hmm. What, what union does that? What union defends their, uh, uh, their members if they are accused of any crime outside of the workplace, if they're if they're even accused, if they're accused of stealing in the workplace, what union comes to their defense? Hmm. I you don't think there's a union that exists yeah. that does that. But there's one union that does, the police union. The police union defends murderers. 
The police union raises, the police union hires lawyers. The police union does, and then when when we when we take them to civil court and sue them, our taxpaying dollars is what goes into the settlement. So yeah, that is, you mean by you, is that the kind of immunity you're talking about? Uh, basically, yes, to keep them from being individually sued at all. That's being taken off uh, the table. Not only, been... not only sued, but also keeps them from being criminally charged. Yes. Yes. And the, that's... Same, the same process also hmm. keeps them from being criminally charged and, and makes us pay taxes, taxpayer dollars for the police repression that exists in our communities. We're, hmm. we're, they, they, they murder our people and then we our, our taxpaying dollars pay off the settlements and we pay for it <laughs> yeah that's so that's that's just really ridiculous yeah I, I don't think that there is anything that encapsulates the completely uh unequal and and oppressive uh power relationship between policing as it exists today and the policed, and we're not talking about, uh, Frank, you know, mostly white people in middle class and, and upper class communities, because in some regards, they already have community control over their police. They, if they don't like the way the police are operating in their communities, they complain and things change. It does not happen in our communities. So we are really talking about changing the power dynamic between specific groups of people and the law enforcement apparatus that's used by this capitalist white supremacist system to control that oppressed group of people. Um, and I just have to say, Frank, that the statistic that you gave a little earlier about 300,000 enslaved people generating, did you say $3 billion yeah, of $3, profit? $3 billion. That was what the, what the, what the slaveholders. That was what their, their their property value was est estimated at com combined at the time that the Civil War, War broke out about three billion dollars, which was which was a whole lot of money back then. Now that would be wow. damn near a trillion dollars, you know. Yeah. So yeah. so uh, yeah, and 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 the 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 highest form of investment, in other words, where you got the greatest amount of return on, was 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 to buy a slave. And the sell mm -hmm. a slave, buying and selling slaves, buying and selling slaves. And people would be so, mistaken if they think that this capitalist system that we are struggling against still and even more intensely in the streets right now has changed that much from uh, that time during our ancestors' enslavement. The system hasn't slay, uh, changed, they've just uh, changed the nature of enslavement to look a little bit different, but it's still the same system. So Frank, you and your organization have been fighting for community control over the police and community control over our communities for 30 years, since the 70s. So we have, we have got to be serious. We have got to be serious in understanding what we are fighting for, what we're fighting against, and what we want on the other, si on the other side of this. So how do people connect with you and your organization, the National Alliance Against Police and, uh, I'm sorry, against racist and political repression in order to get those connections and get this right, get this revolution right and finish it this time? Okay, uh, that's easy. Um, go to nwarpr.org. That's our website. And you can join our organization. On the day of, when we had an international day of, of protest on May the 30th. Just on that one day, and that was doing this, that's been doing this rebellion, right? On that one day, 700 people came into our organization nationally. Wow. On that one day. Now, people have been constantly joining since. So you can help make a movement like ours irresistibly powerful by simply joining it and getting engaged in this struggle. So we encourage everyone, you know, within the sound of my voice to go to nwrpr.org and become a part of this movement, become part of this organization to make sure that the changes that we're advocating, to make sure that the changes that we're dreaming about 
that we can make that happen because only we the people can make it happen. The politicians are not going to make this happen. And, you know, I, I have to uh, end by saying that I think, Frank, that you and I feel the same level of uh, intensity and urgency as we're talking about this issue. I hope that came across in this discussion that we have had that people are watching right now because we are in the midst of a very serious struggle for where we will go as a country and what will happen to us as a people. So time is of the essence. and We don't have any time to keep playing games and playing nice with people. So I really appreciate you, Frank, coming on and laying down the truth and the history behind this push for what needs to be community control over the police and nothing short of that. So I really, really honor and appreciate your time today. Okay, we thank you as well. And I thank you all for watching. This is Jackie Lukeman in Washington, D.C., the belly of the beast. Stay angry, my friends. Stay in these streets. Finish the revolution. <laughs>